In the history of the FBI, there have only been five people officially labeled public enemy number one. In 1930, Al Scarface Capone was the first, and in 1934, John Jackrabbit Dillinger was declared public enemy number one. Upon the death of Dillinger, the number one spot went to Pretty Boy Floyd. And after he was killed, Babyface Nelson was named public enemy number one. And upon Nelson's death, the, quote, honor went to Alvin Creepy Carpus. At this point, I have to think, to get to number one, you're going to have to have a pretty catchy nickname. Carpus was given the nickname Creepy because of what was called his sinister smile. His crimes ranged from kidnapping to robbery and burglary to murder. Carpus served 26 years as an inmate on Alcatraz, longer than any other federal prisoner on what the public called The Rock. But this story's not about Scarface or Jackrabbit, Pretty Boy, Babyface, or Creepy. This is the story of a young kid who was inspired by these infamous criminals, who looked upon them as... Young kids today would look at Tom Brady or LeBron James, and eventually was not only successful at becoming one of them, but befriending the worst of the bunch. My name is Jeff Argent, and this is the High Adventure Podcast. Hello and welcome to Season 4 of the High Adventure Podcast. If you're new to the High Adventure Podcast, I'd encourage you to go back and listen to the previous seasons. I think you might enjoy some of those stories. We're going to jump right into this story without our normal commercials, but I would encourage you to go to our website and the show notes and check out our sponsors and affiliates. Those really do help get this podcast out to you as often as we can. And don't forget our feature documentary, Assault in El Capitan, that's available on streaming sites everywhere. And last but not least, our audiobook, Everest Alone, Maurice Wilson's 1934 journey to be the first person to stand on the summit. Everest Alone is available on our website and through most audiobook publishers. You can reach us on all the usual social media platforms, but the easiest way is to probably go to our website, accidentalproductions.net. You can contact us through the website and find all of our content right there. We also post these episodes on both our YouTube and Vimeo channels, and both of these channels are under our company name of Accidental Productions. I'm very excited to announce that we're going into production on a couple new shows that will be coming out very shortly. More on those shows and previews for those shows will be coming very soon. These shows are going to be very different in content and format, so stay tuned. There's more information coming. The story we're starting in this episode is somewhat personal. This is the story of Nathan Glenn Williams, known throughout his life as Glenn. Glenn was a friend of mine. Glenn and I spent quite a bit of time together talking about life's twists and turns, and his life certainly had more twists and turns than the average one, and certainly more than my life. Glenn was a bank robber by profession. He'd committed untold number of crimes in his 40-year criminal career, but if you asked Glenn what he did as a career, he would tell you that he was a bank robber. Once I asked Glenn why he didn't just go get a job, he looked at me genuinely confused and kind of a bit insulted, and he said, I had a job. I was a bank robber. He was a very interesting and curious guy. When talking with Glenn, there was nothing that was off the table. He would tell horror stories of reformatories and jails and prisons that he'd been incarcerated in. On one unique day, Glenn and I took the short boat ride out to Alcatraz, and I walked the halls and grounds with him as he told me stories of what it was really like to be incarcerated in Alcatraz. Alcatraz is now a national park, and it's run by rangers and the National Park Service. And given that Glenn had been an inmate, they pretty much give him free reign of the island when he visited. That meant when he and I went out on the island, we could walk around without escorts to any part of the island and in any building we chose. 
We sat in his old cell, and we sat on the steps of the yard where he passed the hours watching inmates play baseball, and from there he could see the vibrancy of San Francisco just over the wall and about a mile away, and that was sort of its own kind of torture. We went into the shops where he had once worked and down into the caves where inmates in earlier years had been chained to walls for days and weeks at a time, a fact that the federal government did not acknowledge until the late 1990s. In fact, Alvin Creepy Carpus had spent a great deal of time chained in those caves. They were dark and they were damp and they were, the walls were seeping with water. It was just a miserable, miserable place. And uh, you can't really categorize that as anything other than torture. And that was going on. That went on for decades. When I met Glenn, he was a gentle old man who was kind and soft-spoken. He was modest and remorseful. He loved seeing my son, who was very young at the time, stumble through the beginnings of his life. And, and at times I could see in Glenn's eyes that he was thinking about his youth and how his life began and would become something very different than what my son would ever experience. But truthfully, at that point in my son's young life, we had no idea if he would become a bank robber, as Glenn had become, or an astronaut, or a baseball player, or a carpenter. As parents, you want the best for your children, and Glenn's parents certainly had the same feelings for him that my wife and I had for our young child. But Glenn had become a bank robber and had a criminal career that spanned four decades. That's certainly not what any parent hopes for, but here we were, sitting with bookends of a life, one just beginning with everything unknown, and one in the autumn of his life when all was done and known and supremely regretful to many. So what took this kid from a small town in Washington state across the country on a crime spree so widespread and so diverse that it landed him on Alcatraz, the most infamous prison next to Devil's Island that the world has ever known? There was a quarter moon hanging halfway across the Bay Bridge. It was dark, and the choppy waters of San Francisco Bay were slapping against the hull of the small wooden boat. Between the slapping waves and the sputtering diesel engine, it was hard to hear the rattle of the chains that had incapacitated him and the twelve other men who likely thought this was the last boat ride they would ever take, at least while alive. Soon he would step on to Alcatraz, and it was unlikely he would ever step off. He remembered that three months earlier, an inmate had tossed a note into his cell while he was in McNeil Island's federal penitentiary. The note read, Rumor has it pretty strong that you are slated for Alcatraz. And now here he was, being pushed off this small boat onto a dark dock shrouded in fog and filled with fear. Nervous guards pointed rifles at them from three feet away. They were chained from head to toe. What did the guards think could happen? Thirteen men shrouded in chains trying to move in some kind of a rhythm. Thirteen men whose spirits had been broken at the moment they were told they were being transferred to Alcatraz. The public had very little idea of what went on in that penitentiary, but inmates across the country knew in minute detail. They learned through stories from friends and colleagues and business partners who had all done time on Alcatraz. Even if the stories inmates told each other were embellished, the fear of any unknown can be debilitating, but the thought of spending the next three decades in what has been described as a true hell on earth can be psychologically devastating. Glenn was born in 1915, but Glenn's criminal career didn't begin until 1926. Yeah, I said 1926. He was 11 years old. In 1926, the population of the United States was 117 million. In September of 1926, the Great Miami Hurricane devastated the Greater Miami area, causing $100 million in damage. It's estimated that if a similar hurricane hit Miami today, $1,000 
it would cause $235 billion in damage. That increase is due to the enormous development of Miami that it saw after the Great Hurricane and the land boom that was a result of that hurricane. In New York, the Yankees lost to the St. Louis Cardinals in the 1926 World Series, while in Midtown Manhattan, the NBC radio network was born. Earl Cooper won the 1926 Indianapolis 500 with an average speed of 111 miles an hour. The Chrysler Imperial pace car that year was driven by Louis Chevrolet. Fox Film bought the patents to the movie tone sound system for the recording of sound directly onto film, and that paved the way for the first talking picture in 1927. Jerry Lewis and Hugh Hefner were born in 1926. Harry Houdini, Rudolph Valentino, and Abraham Lincoln's son Robert Todd Lincoln died that year. Back in Wenatchee, Washington, young Glenn Williams was at first idolizing and then emulating the celebrity criminals of the day. The newspapers and then the newsreels that were shown in theaters before each movie chronicled and mythologized criminals like Al Capone and Machine Gun Kelly, John Dillinger, and the man who would become close friends with Glenn, Alvin Creepy Carpus. Communication in the 20s and 30s was certainly not what it is today. There's no internet, meaning there's no email, no social media, obviously. And the television industry was in its very, very early infancy. So unless you were one of the few public enemies number one and got your face in theater newsreels, no one really knew what anyone else looked like. A career criminal could crisscross the country, unhampered by the fear of being recognized. Though the fax machine was invented in 1846, law enforcement wasn't using faxes as a communication tool. Everything was very local, and crime and trouble was handled locally, and when a criminal left town, it was more a relief than one of dogged pursuit from city to city. Most crimes were never reported to other cities or other law enforcement agencies. It was the neighborhood cop on the beat time. As the FBI developed and spread across the country, they occupied themselves with big crimes and doing whatever they could to bolster the ego and the whims of J. Edgar Hoover, who was a lot more interested in his own power and fame than actually stopping crime. Catching high-profile criminals gave him fame and power, but didn't do much to actually curtail crime in the form of low-level criminals who traveled the country passing bad checks and robbing small rural banks of small amounts of money. As a kid, Glenn idolized the criminals he saw in the newsreels and at the movies, and he wanted nothing more than at the age of 11 to become one of them. He read every story he could get his hands on that chronicled drug dealers, gun runners, bank robbers, and murderers. Though his parents forbid him and his brother from seeing these movies that portrayed criminals, Glenn would lie to his parents and go to the theater and see these movies anyway. For some inexplicable reason, Glenn began to despise anyone in uniform and anyone in a position of power, and this included police and his teachers. Glenn's reaction to discipline was lashing out and fighting. Anyone trying to stop Glenn from doing what he wanted to do would find themselves defending themselves against a flurry of fists, and that included police and teachers. Early on, the police would pick up Glenn, and they would take him home and lecture him on the trip back to his house. Getting home meant the usual beating by his father with a branch from an apple tree. Wenatchee, Washington in 1926 was an economically depressed town that each year was invigorated by the fruit crops that brought work and money to town. But the normal state of Wenatchee was less than utopian. Coal in those days was the primary source of fuel. Stoves burned it for cooking, and that same stove doubled as the single heat source for the entire house. The local coal company that sold the coal was housed next to the railroad tracks where coal cars came in daily and offloaded their cache of cargo. Men shoveled the coal onto conveyor belts that transported the coal into the large coal house before being sold and delivered to the wealthier citizens of Wenatchee. The poorer people of Wenatchee would take a shovel and wheelbarrow down to the coal house in the evening and scavenge the small piles of coal that had fallen off the conveyor belt onto the ground. 
Glenn later remembered how sad he thought it was that the poor were reduced to waiting for coal to fall to the ground so they could scavenge it for themselves. Not for profit, but as a staple for sheer survival. Then Glenn saw an opportunity to help the poor people of Wenatchee. With three friends and using a little toy wagon, he would pull open the door of the coal house after all the workers had left for the day and fill his little wagon with coal. He then had pulled the wagon through the poorer sections of town, selling the coal for far below market value, but enough to put a substantial amount of money in an 11-year-old's pocket. For the owner of the coal company, it was one thing to let the poor shovel up scraps of coal that had fallen off the conveyor belt, but it was an entirely different issue to have a kid steal the coal from his warehouse and become a competitor. But the coal company was not Glenn's only adversary. When an older boy heard what Glenn and his friends were doing, he threatened to beat Glenn up unless he was cut in on the deal. Glenn refused, and the fight was on. The older, stronger boy was beating up the 11-year-old Glenn pretty badly when Glenn pulled out a small, concealed lead pipe that he'd carried for just such an occasion. He beat the kid to the ground with the pipe. The kid managed to get away, running fast as blood poured from his head from the gash left by Glenn's pipe. Again, Glenn was 11 years old. It wasn't long before the local sheriff heard of the boy's entrepreneurial enterprise, and he and his two deputies were waiting for Glenn and his partners one night at the coal house. With guns drawn on the three kids, two of them did as they were told and laid on the ground. Glenn turned and ran, thinking that if he got to the apple orchard, he'd be safe. What he didn't count on was the hail of gunfire that chased him as he ran. He woke up the next morning in a jail cell with his father standing at the now open cell door, and Dad was not too happy. Glenn's father had hoped and was sure that this brush with the law was going to be Glenn's first and last, but that wasn't going to be the case. A rash of burglaries swept through Wenatchee in 1926. The police, as described by Glenn later, were hapless and going out of their minds trying to stop the burglaries and find the burglar. They brought in all the known criminals they could find. All were interrogated and some were actually convicted and sent to jail. The sheriff later admitted to Glenn's father that they knew that some of these guys were innocent, but they had to convict someone so the public would get off the cops' backs for not solving the crimes. Glenn knew the truth. He himself had actually been on a burglary and vandalism rampage for some time, and only felt mildly guilty at the thought that others were going to jail for his crimes. After all, he was 11 years old, and they were criminals who seemed unable to avoid the police as he had successfully done, at least during this series of crimes. Soon Glenn was ready to move up and on in his criminal activity. He was soon burglarizing three to four houses a week, but as a kid, what could he take? What does an 11-year-old want? He took pocket knives and coins and other small items that a kid might want. But on one life-changing night, euphoria washed over him as he opened a bedside drawer and found a loaded handgun. He thought this was the one thing that was missing that could make him a serious criminal. It was like a virtuoso musician finding an instrument. At that moment in 1926, at age 11, Glenn's legacy was cemented. If crystal balls were real and Glenn had one, he'd be able to see himself 27 years later shackled to 12 other men in a cold, dark, damp boat motoring to the most infamous prison in the United States history. One day... Shortly after stealing the gun, he was showing his classmates at school how to load and unload the gun. When seen with the gun by his teacher, he ran off from school, and in a surreal moment after coming home from school, his mother was waiting for him with a stick. She instantly began hitting young Glenn with a stick and demanding that he give her the gun. But Glenn had hidden the gun in a tree on his way home and honestly told his mother that he didn't have a gun. The cat was out of the bag later in 1927 when 12-year-old Glenn's mother came into his room to change the sheets on his bed. As she peeled back the sheets, she found several rifles under the blankets. Searching his room, she found stolen coins and other stolen items, and inside a shoebox, she found a loaded handgun. 
what she did next was brave, curious, and I'm sure heartbreaking for her. She found Glenn in the front yard, grabbed him by the arm, and marched him down to the police station. Glenn's brother carried the stolen property and the guns. At his mother's request, little Glenn was locked up in a cell and within days was brought before a judge and sent to the Washington State Training School. A nice name for an old-school reformatory. The place was described as tough. Tough kids, tough staff, and super tough discipline. According to Glenn, most of the kids he'd met after their release had become confirmed criminals. The nickname of the school was College on the Hill, and it seems that's what most kids got there was advanced criminal training and a lot of beatings. In our next episode, Glenn spends his youth in and out of reform schools, picks up the nickname Leatherass, and moves on to bigger and bigger crimes. With the Depression in full swing, Opportunity for the common man was limited, but for people willing to cross the line, take advantage of others, and risk everything they know, the Depression was a golden era. Thank you for listening. Be sure to leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform, and please pass on this podcast to your friends. Don't forget to check out our website, accidentalproductions.net, and as always, we'll leave you with the mushrooms and their song, Hard to Fly. Thank you for supporting our sponsors. We'll see you on the rock. I'm just like my old man, he told me so. Lying on his deathbed, watching the picture show. The product of the night, the bottle and some smoke. <laughs>